is not available to him. So he's taken matters into his own hands by going to his local chemist to purchase it. Mr Lang asked us, if Boots can get enough supplies, why can't NHS Scotland? Can the First Minister answer him? First Minister. Well, the new uh, ATIV vaccine, uh, as I'm sure Ruth Davidson is aware, is manufactured by uh, one supplier who had to significantly ramp up production uh, for the whole of the UK very quickly. That supplier was unable to guarantee sufficient supply for everyone over 65 this year in time for the start of the vaccination uh, programme. That's not uh, something that just affects Scotland. That is an issue right across uh, the UK. Uh, of course, we are advised on vaccination policy by the Independent uh, Expert Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. It was their uh, recommendation uh, that led to this. But let me stress that uh, vaccine offered to 65 to 74 year olds uh, this winter still provides full flu protection. And I think that is an important point of assurance uh, to make to all people uh, across the country. The flu campaign, of course, uh, for this flu season will get underway on the 1st of October and that will offer free flu vaccination to over 2 million people across the country. Ruth Jameson. The First Minister has just repeated the explanation of events that we heard from the Public Health Minister on Tuesday, claiming it's not been possible to buy enough of the new enhanced ATIV vaccine in time and therefore, as a result, it isn't possible to offer a guarantee for people like Mr Lang. But as the First Minister knows, following last year's winter flu outbreak, this is an issue of enormous concern for people, especially elderly people and people who have chronic conditions. But we're told it's only people over the age of 75 who will get the new recommended vaccine. That means that half a million Scots aged between 65 and 75 will not. Can I ask the First Minister, is she personally satisfied with that? First Minister. The reason why it's over 75s is because uh, the recommendation and the advice says that it is that group that this uh, additional vaccine is clinically appropriate for. It's that group of people uh, where the expert advice says that the vaccine that was being used previously perhaps doesn't uh, offer the protection that we want it to. That's why we have prior prioritised over 75s. Uh, but let me uh, repeat again, because I think this is an important point of public reassurance. Uh, the vaccine offered uh, to 65 to 74 year olds uh, this winter does provide flu protection. People with underlying health conditions, pregnant women, healthcare workers uh, will also be offered a new vaccine which provides protection against four different strains of flu. Uh, we already offer uh, a vaccine to all primary school uh, children, uh, unlike in England, I should say, uh, and so they benefit from additional herd immunity as well. Uh, and that vaccine contains an additional flu B strain, which is more likely to affect the working age population. And so uh, this vaccine will provide these groups with further protection against flu during this uh, winter. The supply issues uh, are raised because of the, the change in advice, the different advice that came from the JCVI. Uh, that uh, issue of supply doesn't just affect Scotland, it affects other parts of the UK. I point to an article uh, last week, in fact, in the GP magazine Pulse, which reported concerns in England over shortages of flu vaccines for GP practices. So we will take uh, all appropriate steps to make sure that people across Scotland have the protection from flu uh, that they need to have. And I think it's incumbent on all of us in this chamber to encourage all those who are eligible for the vaccine uh, to take up uh, that eligibility so that we can combat flu as much as possible. Ruth Jameson. The reason that this matters, Presiding Officer, is that we've seen a dramatic rise in flu deaths in this country from 71 two years ago to over 300 last year. Now, the Minister for Public Health said on Tuesday, and the First Minister has just repeated it just now, that the reason that there is a, a shortage of this new vaccine this year is because the manufacturer was unable to guarantee NHS Scotland sufficient supply. And it's true that concerns about provision have been aired. However, just last week, the manufacturer of the new drug confirmed that sufficient supply of flu vaccine for this season. And they stated that the only customers who were missing out are those who ordered late. So why is it that half a million Scottish pensioners are being told they can't have it? First Minister. Uh, I think Ruth Davidson is mischaracterising uh, the position here. She keeps saying I'm repeating what the Public Health Minister said. I'm repeating what the Public Health Minister said because that is the accurate information. Uh, we follow, I, as Ruth Davidson and, and the whole chamber knows, I was Health Secretary uh, for a period of five years. Uh, we, follow, we follow a process for procuring the flu vaccine. 
Uh, it's a well-tried and well-established uh, process. Uh, unlike in England, of course, we nationally procure the flu vaccine. In England, different GP practices are left to do it uh, on their own. Um, and as I said, there are concerns that have been expressed there as well. But let me repeat the information because it is important information. Uh, the group uh, where the advice says the protection from this additional vaccine will be greatest is the over 75s, uh, and that is the group that has been prioritised. Other groups get flu protection from the vaccine that will be available for them. And I do think there is a real need for all of us here to be responsible in the public messaging around this. Um, it is in nobody's interest uh, to scaremonger amongst the population. It is absolutely vital that we encourage people uh, to take up the offer of vaccine. Um, and we will be doing that when the campaign for this winter begins. As I said earlier on, it begins on the 1st of October. Ruth Davison. It's scaremongering to read out what the manufacturer Sequeris has written in the community pharmacy news where they expressly say that the only people who are affected are those who ordered late. Mm -hmm. First Minister, people just want this sorted and it's quite clear that something in the system hasn't worked this year. The SNP government began procuring vaccines for this winter in early autumn last year and they did so in the full knowledge that the vaccine advisory body would be meeting later that year. And it did meet. It met in November and it advised that the new enhanced ATIV vaccine is the one that should be used for people over the age of 65. Yet by that point, NHS Scotland had already placed its order for a different product. So can I ask the First Minister, will she make clear that that won't happen again? Will she continue to work with the manufacturer this year to see if more people under the age of 75, particularly more vulnerable groups, do get the enhanced vaccine? And will she ensure that we have a system in place so people like Mr Lang aren't told no by their local GP and left to fend for themselves? First Minister. Uh, let me give uh, some very clear uh, assurances. Uh, the Scottish Government, as we always have done, will continue uh, to follow the recommendations and the advice of the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. That's the responsible thing to do. Uh, secondly, we will continue to have a proper procurement policy in place for the flu vaccine and indeed for uh, other drugs as appropriate. And the procurement policy we have in place uh, is a centralised national procurement policy in Scotland, which I think is considerably better uh, than the localised arrangements available in other parts of the UK. Uh, and thirdly, we give an assurance uh, that we will ensure that different groups of the population have appropriate protection against flu. And let me repeat again, because I do think it is really important from the point of view of public confidence and assurance uh, that we make very clear that those over 75 where the recommendation is for the ATVI uh, vaccine, that over 75s will have access to that vaccine. Vaccine offered to other groups will provide flu protection um, and that includes uh, those in the 65 to 74 year old uh, age group, people with underlying health conditions, pregnant women, healthcare workers and of course children. Uh, that's the message I think it's important that the public get and I hope everybody across uh, this chamber will join with me in encouraging everybody in a group that's eligible for the flu vaccine to take up that offer of eligibility and give themselves maximum protection against flu this winter. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, to ask why doesn't the First Minister agree with Adam McVeigh, the SNP leader of Edinburgh City Council, when it comes to a small tax on tourists? First Minister. Well, I think, firstly, Adam McVeigh uh, is a fantastic leader uh, of Edinburgh City Council. Let me say that. Uh, first of all, uh, he has a very strong view on the introduction of a tourist tax. That view is shared uh, by many uh, in different parts of the country. Uh, it's not currently Scottish Government policy to have a tourist tax, but of course we will continue to have that discussion and we will continue to consider uh, these matters as we approach our budget this year. And I hope uh, we will have constructive input from Labour on this and indeed a whole range of issues as we consider our draft budget because that would make a refreshing change from previous years when we've considered our draft budgets. Richard Leonard. Well, Adam McVeigh also says that at least £11 million of revenue could be raised in Edinburgh by the introduction of a small levy on overnight stays. And Highland Council say that a charge of £1 on beds per night in the Highlands would generate £12 million of additional annual revenue. And we know that that revenue is badly needed. Adam McVeigh told this parliament 
that Edinburgh City Council spent over £1 million extra during the Edinburgh Festival alone just to keep the city clean because of the influx of tourists. And there are other costs as well. Councillor Bill Lobben told this Parliament that in the Highlands, because of tourism, and I quote him, our infrastructure is deteriorating, which would lead to a negative impression that causes reputational damage. The First Minister talks of protecting Scotland's tourism industry, but why won't she act to protect Scotland's local services, those very services that our tourism industry relies on? First Minister. Well, firstly, partly, partly thanks to the actions of this government, Scotland has a booming uh, tourist industry uh, right now with tourist numbers, tourist spend increasing year on year. But, you know, there is, there is a serious... Uh, I'm trying to be constructive uh, and perhaps even build some consensus around this. I think there is a serious issue for debate and discussion here. I don't think it's any surprise that council leaders like Adam McVeigh and others see the revenue raising potential of a tourist tax. But equally, it's no surprise that there are voices of concern within the tourist sector itself, within the hospitality sector, within the catering sector. I've seen a letter, uh, I think, addressed to me uh, and to the tourism minister just this week uh, setting out some of those concerns. So where does that take us? That takes us to a position where a responsible government should responsibly consider this and listen to all of the arguments before we come to a decision. And that's what we will do. Uh, we will do that uh, in the run-up to our draft budget and perhaps beyond our draft budget and make sure that our decision-making is properly informed by evidence. I'm not sure what in that uh, Richard Leonard could find to disagree with. So perhaps uh, Richard Leonard, as I say on this and on other things, uh, will for a change ensure that the Labour party here actually makes a constructive and positive contribution to the budget process this year. Richard Leonard. Well, we're just asking you to make your mind up on this question. Yeah. This, week, this week we have seen reports that Edinburgh City Council faces £28 million worth of cuts in the next financial year. This will mean cuts to schools, but it will also lead to cuts to tourism critical services like roads maintenance, like rubbish collections, like road sweeping, and even public toilets. Today is World Tourism Day. Tourism in Scotland is now worth £11.2 billion. It increased. It increased by 17%. So, in light of that, does the First Minister seriously believe that increase in the cost of a hotel room by a couple of pounds a night is too high a price to pay for better funded local services. First Minister. Firstly, um, Richard Leonard should maybe listen to the answers before he reads out the next scripted question. Uh, but, but firstly, Firstly, can I thank Richard Leonard for paying such warm tribute to the success of the Scottish Government in boosting tourism in Scotland. It is down to, it is down to things like road equivalent tariff, for example, helping our island communities. Uh, our infrastructure uh, tourism fund helping communities cope uh, with the additional demands of tourism. It's down to Scottish Government investment in tourist attractions like the new V&A in Dundee, for example. So thank you to Richard Leonard uh, for paying tribute to all of that and more. Uh, but he asked me to reach a decision. We will reach a decision, but we will do that in a proper, considered way where we listen to the views on both sides of this debate and come to an informed decision based on the evidence. And can I say to Richard Leonard that if we were to do anything other than that, if we were to rush that decision, I'm pretty sure he would be the first one standing up criticising us for not listening to all of the voices uh, that are being raised. So we will do this properly and perhaps, uh, perhaps Richard Leonard uh, would also recognise the fact that this year uh, we are, of course, protecting local government budgets in real terms, protecting the people of Scotland from the austerity of Tory governments that Richard Leonard and his party are too happy to see continue governing Scotland. We have some constituency supplementaries. The first from Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 
the First Minister will be aware of the allegations raised by Highland doctors of a culture of bullying in NHS Highland, which they described as endemic and systemic. I met with the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport shortly after her appointment to raise this and other matters. I wonder if the First Minister would agree with me that we need a full independent inquiry into these serious allegations, as I can tell her there is no confidence in, 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 in an internal investigation by NHS Highland. First Minister. Well, the Health Secretary uh, spoke with the Chair of NHS Highland, David Alston, this week and made uh, crystal clear her expectation that this issue uh, be addressed thoroughly. Uh, we understand that the Chair hopes to meet uh, the signatories to the letter to discuss their concerns as soon as possible and has also encouraged other staff to come forward if they have any concerns that they uh, wish to report. Uh, let me make absolutely clear the welfare of staff in our <coughs> NHS is paramount. Everything must be done to eradicate any bullying uh, in the workplace and we have made clear to health boards that bullying and harassment is unacceptable and we expect them to ensure any reported incidences are taken seriously and fully investigated and of course we're introducing legislation to establish an independent national whistleblowing officer for NHS Scotland to go live by the end of September next year. Claire Baker. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, on Sunday morning, the family of Shekubayu woke up to a leaked story in a national newspaper alleging that the Lord Advocate would not bring forward any criminal charges in relation to his death in police custody. Does the First Minister agree with me that after waiting for three years for any answers and not due to meet the Lord Advocate until next month, this leak is unacceptable and is no way to treat a grieving family? Will she carry out a full investigation into how this leak came about? And will she also apologise to Sheku's family for the distress that they have suffered as a result of the weekend's press story? First Minister. Um, I De definitely uh, deprecate any information. I don't know uh, the, the truth or otherwise of uh, information always that uh, appears in the public, but I deprecate information uh, that is in the public about matters such as this uh, before families uh, have the opportunity to be uh, informed. Uh, my thoughts remain very firmly with both the family and the friends of Sheikh Abayu at this difficult time for them. It would, of course, not be appropriate uh, for me to comment on the specific circumstances of the case until such a time as a decision has been made uh, by the Crown and then communicated to the family. Uh, the previous Lord Advocate, of course, made clear in 2015 that regardless of the outcome uh, of the investigation, uh, as far as uh, potential prosecution is concerned, uh, a fatal accident inquiry uh, would be held to provide public scrutiny into the circumstances of uh, the incident. And I personally made clear to Mr Bay's family uh, when I met them that we, as a government, are not ruling out anything in terms of a wider inquiry at an, important, uh, an appropriate point in the future. Uh, that is something that definitely remains an option, but of course it's only a decision that we can take at the appropriate time. And Jackie Bailey. The Scottish Government is about to change procurement rules for printing services, which will effectively remove the opportunity for small local firms to get work from Scotland's public bodies. Ian Robertson, Director and Vice President of Print Scotland, said that the government strategy flies in the face of ministers' claims of wanting SMEs to be involved in public procurement. He said, and I quote, put bluntly, the Scottish print industry is in the process of being offshored. Does she agree with his comments? Will the First Minister intervene to stop this? And when will she instruct a review of public procurement so that small businesses in Scotland can benefit? First Minister. Well, firstly, I am aware of the concerns that have been expressed by the print industry. I know that the Finance Secretary has already agreed to meet with Print Scotland to discuss them. Uh, we actually have two frameworks in place to provide print services. We recently conducted a procurement for the single supplier publishing print design and associated services framework. Uh, the award was made in August to APS Group, which is a Scottish registered company based in Leith here in Edinburgh. We've also commenced a procurement exercise to re-elect the print and associated services framework. Currently, 10 of the 12 framework suppliers are Scottish printing SMEs. Uh, but we will use recent stakeholder analysis to inform our decision on the number of suppliers to be appointed to the new print framework. And we expect to issue an invitation to tender for these services in the autumn 
of this year. In terms of APS, they will continue to utilise their extensive supply chain. This currently includes, uh, as I understand, 114 SMEs, 89 of which are Scottish, including printers across uh, the country. In terms of procurement, more uh, widely, of course, uh, we passed the Procurement Reform Scotland Act in 2014, which recognises the importance of SMEs, third sector organisations and supported businesses uh, to the Scottish economy and includes a range of measures designed to assist them. I met with the Federation of Small Businesses just yesterday, in fact, where uh, procurement was one of the things uh, we discussed and I look forward to taking a dialogue forward with them uh, to consider uh, how we further benefit small businesses in our economy. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, public and scientific concern about climate change are rising ever higher, and the Scottish Government's latest report card presents a mixed picture. Scotland is doing better than the UK, but that's damning with faint praise, and it's certainly not the benchmark we should be aiming for. The report makes clear that the end of coal-fired power generation, which the Scottish Energy Minister at the time wanted to delay, is masking a lack of progress in other areas. And it says the strategy must now move on decisively. So to take one specific, why does the First Minister believe that transport emissions have kept on rising every year for the last three years when they should be going down? First Minister. Well, I think it's important to look uh, at what the Committee on Climate Change actually said in their report uh, this week, it said that Scotland continues to lead the way in the UK in terms of tackling climate change. Indeed, we continue to lead the world. Uh, we met our 2016 target, which is the third annual target to be met. Uh, emissions are 49% uh, below the 1990 levels, which of course already exceeds our original 42% reduction target by 2020. Uh, the report says we're on track uh, not just to meet, but to outperform the new target of 56% by 2020. It praised the proposals in the climate change uh, plan uh, and said that they were, and I'm quoting here, stretching, uh, credible and well balanced. Uh, so I think that's actually a good report card for Scotland's performance in cutting emissions and tackling climate change, and we should be proud of it. Of course, we know that we need to replicate the success in areas particularly around electricity and waste in other sectors of the economy and that's uh, what the plan is doing. Uh, we also need to up our ambition in terms of the targets which is why the new climate change bill uh, targets the 90% reduction uh, for all greenhouse gases which of course would uh, ensure that we would be carbon uh, neutral by the time we meet uh, that target. In terms of transport, one of the areas uh, that the Committee on Climate Change report looked at was around uh, transport and actually had uh, lots of good things uh, to say uh, about the government's work in terms of the rollout of electric vehicle uh, infrastructure. So I think there's a lot to be positive about there, but we know we have, uh, in common with other countries across the world, a lot more work still to do. But we should take comfort from the fact that we're ahead of the game uh, in terms of the performance of other countries, and it's something we should be proud of, but determined to build on. Patrick Harvey. Well, this is one of the problems with this whole debate. Any government can list a few of the good things they're doing, a few of the positive steps they're taking. But if those steps are outweighed by the harm being done elsewhere, then the problem still grows. While public transport is expensive, in many places unavailable, urban space is dominated by cars, and the aviation industry is given a free pass, transport emissions will keep going up. And the same contradictions are there in energy as well. Scotland's doing well on renewables, but this week the Greens were, I think, the only political party not jumping for joy at the discovery of even more fossil fuel reserves. When will the Scottish Government understand that if they keep telling Total, BP and the rest of the lethal fossil fuel industry to keep on drilling, Scotland's reputation as a climate change leader will be a sham? First Minister. Well, Scotland's reputation as a climate change leader is well earned and thoroughly justified, actually, and it's something we should be uh, and recognised internationally by the United Nations and many others. Now, just let me unpack uh, some parts of Patrick Harvey's question. He talked about aviation uh, getting a free pass. Unlike many other countries, uh, Scotland includes emissions from aviation and shipping in the calculation of our targets, not uh, a free pass. Uh, he talked about 
Transport. Let me just read from the Committee on Climate Change uh, report. Since the draft uh, climate change plan, the Scottish Government has made commitments to continue to invest in the Charge Place Scotland network until uh, August 2019 and provide further loan funding for electric vehicles until 2020. Uh, the Energy Strategy uh, commits to additional policy measures, including expanding electric charging infrastructure and further funding for charging points. So, uh, the Committee itself pointed to the real progress that Scotland is making here in terms of of our responsibility to reduce emissions from transport. In terms of uh, oil and uh, energy more generally, of course, our energy strategy uh, commits us uh, to some of the most stretching targets anywhere in the world. And of course, uh, in terms of electricity uh, generated, I mean, we meet uh, well over half now of our electricity demand from renewable uh, sources. In the last year, we saw renewable power generation up by 27% just in the last year alone. So, you know, I, I think it's right that a Green Party continues to push the government to do it further, but once in a while, I think a Green Party uh, would actually want to take some pride from the fact that they're in a country that is recognised internationally as a world leader, and it might make a bit of a change occasionally for Patrick Harvey to do that. Some, some further supplementaries. The first from Ian Gray. Thank you. Uh, a report published this week by Children in Scotland, the National Autistic Society Scotland and Scottish Autism shows that many autistic young people face unlawful exclusion from school on a regular basis. That is a disgraceful situation. What action will the Scottish Government take to correct it? First Minister. Well, I firstly agree with Ian Gray that uh, for autistic children to be unlawfully excluded from school is unacceptable and to use his uh, terminology that is uh, disgraceful. If that happens to a single child uh, then that child is being uh, let down. Uh, we have a range of policies as Ian Gray will know given he is a uh, Labour spokesperson in education around inclusion in education and uh, being able to support uh, children uh, to be taught in mainstream education. Of course we are taking a range of actions around direct funding to school that allows schools themselves to put in place particular measures uh, to support uh, those children who need support. I'm sure the Education Secretary would be very happy to correspond with or, or meet with Ian Gray uh, to discuss the range of additional measures that we can take uh, to address something that I think all of us agree uh, we do not want to see happen in our schools. Tom Arthur. Flooding officer, our police officers represent the very best of Scotland, working tirelessly all year round to keep us safe. Does the First Minister agree that, given their hard work and dedication, Scotland's police officers deserve a significant pay rise? And does she therefore welcome yesterday's announcement of the best pay deal for officers in the last 20 years? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I very warmly welcome the fact that we have this week been able to agree a pay rise for our police officers that the Scottish Police Federation has described as the best uh, pay rise for 20 years. I think that's something that should be welcomed right across the chamber. 6.5% uh, uh, over a 31-month period. And of course, this is in addition to the pay deal uh, we've agreed with NHS staff uh, of 9% over the next three years. Uh, I think it does underline how much we value the contribution of our public sector workers. Uh, and I'm very pleased uh, that we are in the position of agreeing that this week. It stands of course in marked contrast to the position elsewhere in the UK where the, the head of the Met Police in London described uh, the UK government's pay, officers, uh, pay offer to police officers as a punch on the nose. I'm delighted that we value our police officers uh, and this pay deal I think recognises that. Colin Smith. Beside an officer, last week we learned ScotRail's performance was at a record low and punctuality the worst since 2005. This week, ScotRail's own figures showed performances deteriorated so badly they would have been in breach of their franchise agreement had the Transport Secretary not secretly reduced their target without telling Parliament. Does the First Minister agree that the way to make our trains run on time, ensure they aren't overcrowded and not ripping off commuters is not to fiddle the performance figures to cover up, cover up failing performance, but to have a railway system that starts to put passengers ahead of profits. First Minister. 
Well, firstly, in, in terms of the performance uh, benchmarks, actually that uh, is something that is uh, allowed under the terms of the Franchise Agreement. Uh, the Railways Act allows for Ministers to exercise discretion where there are particular issues, in this case, particular issues uh, caused by severe hot weather in the early part of the summer. But let's turn to ScotRail performance. Nearly 90 out of 100 trains arrive within the recognised punctuality uh, measure. The latest figures show that ScotRail's public performance uh, measure is better than the GB average. But here's the key point, because we are heavily investing to improve our railways to make sure uh, that there are, is more capacity in our railways, that there are more modern trains on our railways. But here's the thing. Uh, if you look at the period uh, in the latest Office of Road and Rail uh, report, uh, more than half of all the cancellations and delays are caused uh, not by issues that are the responsibility of ScotRail, but by issues that are responsibility of Network Rail. Now, why am I mentioning that? because this parliament is not responsible for network rail. We are the ones arguing for it to be devolved. Labour are the ones still standing in the way of that. So it comes back to this age-old issue for Labour. If they want to will the ends of something in performance, they really have to help us get the means to do it. So I look forward to the support coming from Labour for the devolution of network rail as soon as possible. Runa Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It emerged yesterday that the UK Government has quietly appointed a Minister for the Protection of Food Supplies, the first time this has happened since World War II. Does the First Minister agree that when you are contemplating rationing, it's time to stop this Brexit madness? First Minister. Well, I think this is news actually that would have made most people uh, across the UK really stop in their tracks. You know, the Tory stewardship uh, of Brexit and the UK as a whole is now proving so catastrophic that they've had to appoint a Minister for Food Supplies, which is the first time there's been such a post held since World War II. You know, how has it come to this situation? Uh, it sh is shameful and should be a source of shame for a long time to come to every single member of the Conservative Party. Uh, I certainly hope that it doesn't uh, come to food rationing in this uh, country. I certainly agree with the question uh, that things are becoming so shambolic that it is time to draw a halt to uh, this uh, Brexit catastrophe. Uh, but let me tell you this, if there ever it does come a day where there's food rationing in this country because of a Tory Brexit, perhaps the first people who should be bearing the burden of that are Boris Johnson, Jacob Rees-Mogg, David Davis, Michael Gove, all of these people who perpetrated a dishonesty on the people of this country. Let's how, uh, see how they enjoy uh, their Brexit bonanza. Question number four, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to improve recycling rates and the quality of recycling. First Minister. Well, statistics were published earlier this week which showed that for the first time we now recycle a greater proportion of our household waste in Scotland than we send to landfill. Uh, that's a fantastic achievement. Uh, figures earlier this year highlighted that we now recycle more than 60% of waste from all sources. Uh, and while these are significant milestones, uh, we know there's more to do on household recycling. In particular, Zero Waste Scotland is working closely with local authorities to support them in improving their recycling services, including encouraging them to adopt the Scottish Household Recycling Charter. Uh, we also believe that our commitment to establish a deposit return scheme for Scotland will not only increase the amount that we recycle, but will also improve the quality of recycling. Stuart McMillan. I thank the First Minister for that reply. And the recent figures released by SEPA uh, show that in 2017, 57.2% of Inverclyde's household waste was recycled. That's up 3.8% from 2016. Now, this week is Recycle Week 2018, and therefore does the First Minister agree with me that while well, this is an excellent achievement, the Inverclyde Council's decision to this year remove its curbside glass collection service could result in reduced recycling rates locally and it could also damage the good work they actually have been doing. First Minister. Well, I certainly agree that Inverclyde's progress uh, is an excellent achievement, but I also agree that it is vital to sustain that progress uh, both nationally and locally. 
a range of measures are needed, including effective collection services. Uh, I mentioned the Scottish Household Recycling uh, Charter. Uh, that, which is agreed with COSLA, includes glass collection, and we're encouraging all councils to adopt and implement it. And I hope Inverclyde Council will do so. We have a range of initiatives at national level to reduce waste and boost recycling. Uh, these, as I said earlier, include proposals for a deposit return scheme, but also action to reduce food waste and support for circular economy projects. I certainly encourage Inverclyde Council and indeed all local authorities to ensure that they have necessary measures in place to build on and accelerate progress on this really important issue. Maurice Golden. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I declare an interest with respect to my work around the circular economy. In 2010, the SNP said Scotland would be recycling 50% of household waste by 2013. It's now five years later and that target hasn't been met. When will it be? First Minister. Well, we're now recycling more than 60% of waste from all sources. As I said earlier on, for the first time ever, we're recycling a greater proportion of our household waste than we send uh, to landfill. Uh, that, I think, is good progress. And I think all of us should be encouraging not just councils, uh, but individuals across the country to make sure that we continue uh, that progress. But the figures out this week, whatever way you want to look at it, are good news and demonstrate the progress that has been made uh, with the range of investments that the Scottish Government is making. Question number five, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the report that obesity is set to overtake smoking as the biggest cause of preventable cancers in women. First Minister. Well, I know that Cancer Research UK has done fantastic work in helping to raise awareness of the links between obesity and cancer. As our recent diet and healthy weight delivery plan pointed out, obesity is linked to around uh, 2,200 cases of cancer a year in Scotland. I think we all recognise that there's no simple uh, single solution, which is why our healthy weight plan sets out over 60 actions and our recent Active Scotland plan sets out 90 actions to help well-being. One of those actions, uh, of course, is that we will consult shortly in steps to restrict the promotion and marketing of junk food where it is sold to the public, such as uh, multi buys in supermarkets. Brian Whittle. Uh, can I thank uh, the First Minister for that response? And she says obesity is a health issue that has so many other repercussions in the preventable health agenda, not just in preventing cancers. There's type 2 diabetes, musculoskeletal conditions, heart disease and stroke, not to mention the effect on mental health. Which is why I was encouraged by the Scottish Government's announcement last year to deliver a Good Food Nation Bill. It would have given us the opportunity to look at the obesogenic environment around schools, look at delivering a centrally cell procurement contract that supported our, our farmers by procuring locally high-quality produ high produce for our school meals instead of some of the high levels of cheaper imported processed food that is current, the current system allows. It would have allowed us to properly make the link between education and health. So can I ask the First Minister uh, to tell the Chamber why the Scottish Government missed this opportunity by scrapping the Good Food Nation Bill and what will the Scottish Government now put in its place to help deliver a healthier Scotland? First Minister. This issue was uh, debated in Parliament, I think, the week before last, and the Government made clear then, and I'll make clear again today, that we are committed to legislating around our Good Food Nation agenda, and uh, we will set out plans for that in in due course. But the other thing we're determined to do, of course, is take forward uh, those areas that don't necessarily require legislation. Some of what uh, Brian Whittle has talked about, they would not necessarily require waiting for Parliament to legislate. So the uh, strategies that I've talked about, uh, particularly around uh, our diet and healthy weight uh, delivery plan, will help us to take forward this agenda. Uh, I think it is an area where there will undoubtedly be issues where there is disagreement uh, amongst parties and members in this chamber, but I think there will be a great deal of consensus as well. So I look forward to taking forward this agenda, which will have legislation as part of it, uh, over the remainder of this Parliament. And I think it will benefit people uh, right across the country, particularly the, the younger uh, generation, whereas we saw in the Scottish Household uh, Survey this week, we're already seeing uh, very welcome signs of improvement around obesity, uh, drinking amongst uh, younger people, uh, and of course consumption of healthy foods. So there's a lot to be positive about and a lot to build on. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will be aware there are many causes of obesity, including some outlined by Brian Whittle and ways to prevent it, including increasing breastfeeding rates, which hasn't been mentioned. But is she aware that a major cause of obesity for a significant number of Scottish women is undiagnosed, untreated or poorly treated thyroid disorders? And therefore, does the First Minister agree that it is unacceptable for any Scottish NHS board to refuse patients, particularly those under the care of an endocrinologist, 
their prescriptions for liothyronine medication as is happening currently, and will she ask the Health Secretary to intervene to ensure that my constituents and other thyroid sufferers are not stopped by any health board from receiving their life-saving medication, which also has an important impact on reducing obesity for a great many women? Sorry, tangential, uh, can, but I, first can I say, first of all, I agree with the general thrust of Aileen Smith's uh, question. I certainly uh, recognise the links often between obesity and uh, thyroid problems. Sometimes they will be undiagnosed thyroid problems, and I certainly agree that people should have access uh, to the medication and the treatment that they need. Uh, I, I get the sense there is a particular constituency case lying behind Aileen Smith's uh, question, which I don't know the detail of, and uh, I don't think the Health Secretary knows the detail of it either. So if Aileen Smith wants to provide us with that detail, I will certainly ask the Health Secretary to look into it and get back to her with further detail as soon as possible. Possible. Question number six, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister, in light of the, climate, uh, the Committee on Climate Change's recent report, what new action the Scottish Government plans to reduce CO2 emissions? Mm -hmm. First Minister. Uh, the committee's report shows that Scotland met its last three annual targets and continues to outperform the UK in reducing emissions. The report also finds that our climate change plan provides an ambitious and credible package of measures for continuing to meet the targets set by this Parliament's 2009 Act. Of course, Parliament is now considering whether those targets should be increased through the new Climate Change Bill. Uh, we have proposed that the targets should be set to the maximum level of ambition that is credible at this stage. And of course, we will look again at the Climate Change Plan as soon as the new legislation has been finalised and will consider the Committee's recommendations carefully in the meantime. Claudia Beamish. I thank the First Minister for that answer. But we have previously heard the First Minister place a great deal of weight on the advice of the Committee on Climate Change. Now this report highlights a lack of action in agriculture and transport. What will the Scottish Government do specifically to support people working in these industries to contribute to um, emissions reductions in a fair and sustainable way? And we've also heard the First Minister state that Scotland should contribute, I quote, uh, continue, um, contribute fair shares in her speech to the UN Climate Change Conference in Bonn last year. Does she therefore agree with Scottish and now UK Labour that Scotland should have a target of net zero emissions by 2050 at the latest and more robust interim targets to lead us there so we can actually continue to be a global leader. First Minister. Well, Claudia Beamish asked me uh, about transport. I've already answered uh, in terms of transport to Patrick Harvey. I won't uh, repeat all of that, but the progress and the further plans that the Scottish Government has uh, around transport are recognised in the report of the Committee on Climate Change. Uh, she also asked me about uh, agriculture. Uh, emissions in agriculture are actually down 14% since the 1990 baseline. Uh, Scottish farmers do a lot to contribute to the emissions reductions uh, in electricity generation and land use and forestry sectors and the Climate Change Plan includes a range of measures to further encourage farmers and the benefits of low carbon uh, farming and we intend to fully explore the potential for these uh, voluntary measures uh, before considering any change in approach. In terms of targets, though, it's interesting that uh, Claudia Beamish cites uh, UK Labour. I, I listened carefully to Jeremy Corbyn yesterday, actually. He said that he wanted to commit uh, to, uh, it, they say uh, imitation is uh, the finest form of flattery, and certainly in Jeremy Corbyn's speech there was plenty that the Scottish Government has already done uh, that they are, I'm glad to see, following in our wake. But climate change is an interesting example here because he uh, committed uh, Labour yesterday to support uh, a 60% reduction in emissions by 2030. 60% reduction by 2030 sounds good, except we've already got proposals in the new climate change uh, bill before this parliament that commit to a 66% reduction in emissions by 2030. We are ahead of other countries. We are proposing uh, the most stringent and ambitious statutory climate change targets anywhere in the world, and I look forward to having Claudia Beamish's support. Lee MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. In light of transport emissions rising every year since 2010, the Committee on Climate Change has confirmed that transport is now Scotland's biggest uh, sectoral challenge. Uh, in particular, aviation uh, emissions uh, have doubled since uh, 1990. Airports uh, are uh, recording record figures uh, in terms of passenger numbers. So how can she justify a £250 million tax break to the aviation industry through the scrapping of APD? First Minister. Well, we need to have uh, good connectivity, including to our island communities, uh, I have to say, which uh, often 
involves uh, air transport, but we have to make sure uh, two things, that proper account is taken of aviation emissions, which is why it is so important that we include aviation emissions in the calculations of our targets, something that not all countries do. It's also important that we have a balanced transport uh, system, uh, and as the Committee on Climate Change recognises, we are uh, investing and have ambitious plans in terms of the electrification of the transport network. So we will continue to take forward uh, these plans to make sure that there are good connections uh, across Scotland and between Scotland and other countries, but as we do that, making sure that we are fulfilling our international obligations, moral obligations, to reduce emissions and tackle climate change and continue to be a world leader in doing so. Thank you. And that concludes First Minister's questions. That concludes First Minister's questions. We'll move on now to, or shortly, we'll move on to uh, a member's business. But until then, we'll have a short suspension. Just allow the uh, gallery to change and to allow new guests to arrive. A short suspension. In the name of Fulk McGregor, on paternity leave and tackling inequality, this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons now? I call on Fulk McGregor to open the debate. Mr McGregor, please. <clears throat> Thank you, President Officer. Can I begin by thanking all members who supported my motion to bring this important topic to the Chamber today? And also to Fathers Network Scotland and Bliss for their briefings. I know my colleague Jerry Martin will make reference to the impact of paternity leave for families of children born prematurely. President Officer, I think it's fair to say that this SNP government has made some massive steps in gender equality recently, from providing funding to gender equality organisations and its bold and radical plans to increase childcare provision, allowing more parents flexibility, to the passing of recent bills such as the Gender Representation in Public Boards and the new domestic abuse legislation, which for the first time recognises psychological abuse. Presiding officer, we know that everything we do should have equality at its core, and there is still so much to do, which is why this motion takes head on the issues of paternity leave. Just now in the UK and Scotland, fathers get up to two weeks that the dad can take from the birth of the child. Some employers, including the Scottish Government, offer a bit more, up to four weeks, but the general standard is two weeks, one week paid, one week unpaid. This lack of support and recognition for fathers, which is historical, only reflects and reinforces 
cultural assumptions about traditional gender roles, where the father is the breadwinner and the mother is the primary carer. As parliamentarians, we have a duty to challenge that head on. We are way behind many other countries in doing so. For example, in Iceland, Slovenia, Sweden, Finland and Norway all offer between 10 and 12 weeks of paternity leave. And research from these countries strongly indicates that where there is higher paternity leave, there is reported higher levels of gender equality. And recent stats presented to the UK Government show that fathers are carrying out a greater proportion of childcare than ever before. In 1961, the amount of time fathers spent caring for preschool children was 15% of that spent doing so by mothers. But by last year, 2017, it was almost half, meaning that for every hour a mother devotes to caring for a young child, a father now devotes roughly 30 minutes. This is still not equality, far from it, but it is progress. But how can true equality and progress be reached if the structures in place don't allow it? Indeed, if the structures in place are there just to reinforce assumptions about gender roles. Presiding officer, the shared paternity scheme has its benefits and does work for some families, and that, that regard that has to be welcomed. But I agree with Fathers Network in a recent North Lanarkshire Council committee paper that it is fundamentally flawed, because at its essence it is pitting ordinary working class people against each other. In this case, parents who have to work out how to split the very same period of leave. Many who use it do so on financial grounds, and it sends a message that any time taken from the mother to spend attaching with her child is her responsibility, thereby perpetuating the cultural assumptions and does not take into account possible power imbalances. There should be a separate paternity leave policy for fathers. It is clear that modern fathers do want to play more of a role. Various studies and reports suggest this, such as the Modern Families Index 2017. Presiding officer, I speak to you today as a dad of two young children. My eldest is four and my youngest is one. And I love being fully involved in their care, play and learning. So fathers like myself do want to spend more time with their children. But this is not reflected in current legislation around paternity leave, which continues to focus on mum being responsible for the childcare and the housework. But the fact is, presiding officer, that increased paternity leave benefits everyone, benefits everyone and society as a whole. For fathers, it allows them to spend more valuable time with their children. It lowers rates of, post, of male postnatal depression and it helps us men to reflect and challenge those implicit attitudes regarding mothers being the primary caretakers. For mothers, it can allow for a quicker return to work, importantly of course, if that's what they want. It can lower rates of postnatal depression and it can allow women more time to recuperate physically and emotionally after the pregnancy. And for children, it can lead to more time spent with dad. It might seem a very simple one, but true. Because studies show that children with highly involved fathers tend to perform better in terms of cognitive test scores, be more sociable and have fewer behavioural problems. Presiding officer, since lodging this motion in April, I am pleased that it was passed resoundingly by SNP conference in June when it laid the resolution and it is now party policy. I have of course also written to various public bodies and met with private companies about the issue. In May I wrote to every local authority in Scotland. I am pleased since then that North Lanarkshire Council, my own local authority, adopted the policy after it was proposed by the SNP group at its most recent council meeting. From next week, new fathers working for North Lanarkshire will be entitled to four weeks fully paid paternity leave. And presiding officer, yesterday I learned that North Lanarkshire officers have agreed to, date, to backdate the policy to the 21st of June when it was agreed by councillors. Of the other councils, which I have heard from, I understand that Inverclyde and Stirling councils are making positive steps to introduce a higher level, level of paid leave and also understand that progress has been made towards a fairer system in South Lanarkshire and Midlothian. I must add that I was disappointed with, run, with some responses, one in particular from the Chief Executive of Aberdeen City Council, who ruled out a change without even investigating the possible benefits of doing so. Presiding officer, when I wrote to COSL in May, I received a response from the spokesperson for resources, which didn't exactly fill me with confidence. Similar to the response I outlined from Aberdeen Council, it was a straight refusal to even discuss the idea. I wrote again to COSLA following the decision of North Lanarkshire and the response which I received this morning from the Chief Executive was again a flat refusal to put this on the agenda. It is extremely disappointing and I would encourage the political leaders of all parties to overturn this and make sure it is at least discussed. And I would encourage MSPs across the Chamber to please write to your own local authority and ask for change as North Lanarkshire has done. I also wrote to all NHS boards in Scotland almost universally. The response from each board said that any proposed change we need to be approved by the Scottish Workforce and Staff Governance Committee, and I hope there will be an item for discussion at one of their upcoming meetings. 
And following publicity of this campaign, I was contacted by Aviva Insurance and met with them at their offices in Bishop Briggs along with my colleague, constituency MSP Rona Mackay. I was very impressed to hear about their policy of 52 weeks leave and 26 of these fully paid leave for all parents, which of course includes new fathers. They are quite simply leading the way on this issue, and I hope that other large companies throughout the UK will take notice. President Officer, I also wrote to the DWP, and you may be surprised to hear that I did actually get a response. Obviously, I got it in time before they stopped speaking to MSPs. Again, I was extremely disappointed with their response, however. It completely ignored the points I raised and simply pointed to the shared parental leave policy. I've already spoken about this and how it isn't the right way to do things, and I hope that it's reviewed soon. President Officer, do I think that four weeks goes far enough? No, but it's a good start. I'm calling on all public and private organisations to implement a fairer pol policy like North Lanarkshire and Aviva. Your organisation will benefit in the longer term and it will be another small step on the way to the Scotland we want to become. But ultimately, President Officer, this can be sorted at a UK government level. And I'm glad to have the support of MPs Neil Gray and Angela Crawley, who have both committed to raising the issue in London. So my message to the UK government is clear. Please send a clear message and implement separate paternity leave for fathers at, at least at four weeks and preferably up to 12. Do that or devolve the powers to here so that we can go on with continuing the job of making Scotland as fair and equal a country as it can be. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr McGregor. I call Kenneth Gibson, followed by Alison Harris. Mr Gibson, please. Thank you, President Officer. I would first like to congratulate my colleague Fulton McGregor on bringing this important topic uh, to the fore today and what I believe is the first occasion paternity leave has been debated in this chamber. The current provision of parental leave in the UK is complex. We have statutory maternity leave, parental leave, paternity leave, shared parental leave and the right to request flex flexible working, each with its own strict set of eligibility criteria and conditions. This means that some fathers and families may not even be aware of what they are entitled to. Concerns about inequality of access to leave continue to intensify with rising numbers of insecure employment contracts and precarious working conditions such as zero-hour contracts. The growing gig economy and indeed self-employment, which now accounts for 12.1% of the Scottish workforce, shows that our economy is reshaping and family life is not immune to the impact of this. Eligibility for work-life balance support, such as paternal leave, is of course reserved to the UK Parliament and remains dependent on strict conditions based on outdated definitions of work and employment, which inevitably leads to inequalities between workers with and without access to the benefits of paid leave and flexible working. Last year's UK Labour Force survey found that 24% of men in employment are not eligible for paid paternity leave, either because they are self-employed or because they have not worked for their current employer long enough. In order to improve access to family-friendly employment rights and entitlements, legislation must clarify statutory definitions and protections linked to employment status. Moreover, any such clarification must be accompanied by a proactive public awareness campaign to make sure workers know exactly what they are entitled to and therefore better plan for a sustainable work-life balance. Well, women who do not qualify for statutory maternity pay can receive maternity allowance. New fathers, potential fathers or carers-to-be who wish to take paternity leave but do not meet statutory paternity pay conditions have no access to a paternity allowance. This provision does not exist in UK employment law and represents a clear inequality which should and must be remedied. Regarding access to flexible arrangements in the workplace, fathers are much more likely than mothers to report they have no access to arrangements such as flexi-time, part-time working and working from home. Poor access to family-friendly, flexible work arrangements is also found to be more common for male-dominated sectors. Ameliorating this will require a serious shift in the working culture of male-dominated industries, but is a vital step towards equal access to parental leave. Of course, independent of government policy, employers can take a proactive approach to improving life for new fathers in their organisation. For example, Microsoft last month announced that it will require all its contractors to offer employees a minimum of 12 weeks parental leave, impacting everyone from the company's cafeteria workers to janitors to IT support staff to engineering consultants, and this must be welcomed. While this will undoubtedly increase costs for the company, BOSS has highlighted studies that show that better parental leave leads to increased productivity, improved morale and retention of new parents. The Scottish Government is also working to improve the situation of new fathers with the limited powers that it has by providing eligible employees with up to four weeks of consecutive paternity leave at full pay and encouraging other Scottish employers to work in partnership with their workforces to continue voluntarily offering a similar enhanced paternity leave. 
With further devolved powers, the Scottish Parliament would have the ability to make some of the improvements I have already suggested and strengthen employment rights in a way that works for Scotland. Presiding officer, as the Minister for Business, Fair Work and Skills has highlighted in this chamber, flexible working is a clear benefit not only for employees but for employers, as a more flexible workforce can be a more motivated workforce, reducing absenteeism, achieving better retention rates and increasing productivity. Paternity leave is also, most importantly, hugely beneficial to children. In households where fathers take paternity leave, the overall time children have with their parents increases and studies have shown that children whose fathers are more involved in their upbringing tend to be happier, healthier, do better at school, have greater self-esteem and, as Fulton McGregor pointed out, fewer behavioural problems. Family life should be promoted and protected at every opportunity. Fathers receiving the maximum opportunity to look after their children at such a young age is a central part of that, and I therefore support Fulton McGregor's call for fairer access to paternity leave for workers in both the private and public sectors. Thank you, Mr Gibson. I call Alison Harris, to be followed by Monica Lennon. Ms Harris, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank Fulton McGregor for bringing this debate forward for members' business this afternoon, and can I just start by saying that I welcome the broader issue which has been brought forward by this motion. We can all agree that parents should spend as much time with young children as possible. From my own experience, I can say with certainty that those early times are to be especially cherished. And if only I had known at the time when my children were, at, were young just how fast those times would pass. And I'd say to Fulton, you'll blink from the ages your children are, and before you know it, they'll be 20 and 22. So enjoy, <laughs> please. Right. In my brief time today, I will try to examine what is stopping parents, and fathers especially, from doing just that, spending more time with their newborn children. The biggest hindrance, I feel, is ingrained cultural views. That is shown by a recent University of Edinburgh study, which found that fathers in Scotland often feel too worried or embarrassed to fully use their paternity rights. Social culture, even in 2018, has not progressed to the point where fathers feel comfortable taking time off work at this pivotal moment, not only in their lives, but their families' lives as well. Even, families, well, even when families can comfortably afford it, fathers often have a nagging doubt that employers will view their time off negatively. In some workplaces, there is a persistently, overtly masculine culture that views time off to tend a newborn baby as simply inappropriate. Of the respondents to the 2017 Modern Families Index, 44% said that they had lied or bent the truth to their employer about, the, uh, uh, employer about family related responsibilities that might be seen as interfering with work. Regrettably, that is what many people feel they must do. I mean, how sad is this? We've come a long way since the 1960s when the amount of time fathers spent caring for their children was barely 15% in relation to the time mothers spent doing the same. According to the House of Commons Library research as, as of 2017, this figure is now almost half of the time that mothers spend. But this also demonstrates that we still have a long way to go. What we need most, therefore, is a widespread change of attitude. It must become the norm for both parents to take leave. Research, both international and from the Scottish Parliament Information Centre, has demonstrated the beneficial effects when fathers are involved in childcare. By encouraging a shift in opinion of paternity leave, we can also help to tackle the stubborn gender pay gap. In 2018, fathers are continued to be seen far too often as the primary breadwinners for a family and the mother as the carer. Talented women should not be exiled from the workforce because they choose to have a child. It is possible to have the best of both worlds, juggling parenthood with careers. In this respect, the UK's government introduction of the shared and flexible parental leave is most welcome. Working couples now have the opportunity to share up to 50 weeks of leave and up to 37 weeks of pay. That system means that eligible families can choose how they balance their work and caring commitments giving greater flexibility to the family. If you just let me continue for a little while at the moment now. That is the correct practical approach that helps fathers spend time with their children and mothers continue successful careers. Although I did listen with interest to what Fulton McGregor did say about North Lanarkshire Council and I think that all advancements are most welcome. 
But prior to this debate, I was also contacted by Aviva, who told me that they have adopted a policy which allows parents employed by them to take some amount of paid and unpaid time off, regardless of gender, sexual orientation or how they became a parent, whether birth, adoption or surrogacy. In short, this means that they are offering up to one year of leave, of which 26 weeks is at full basic pay for each parent employed by their company within the first 12 months of a children's arrival. They believe that this is one of the most family-friendly policies of any employer and they're keen to get the message out so that others will follow. This policy adopted by Aviva is to be highly commended. However, I do accept also you know, what Kenny Gibson said, and I think if you're in a self-employed position, that does alter things. And I, for my second child, was self-employed, and it was a very different scenario where you were forced to go back to work a lot quicker than you really wanted. Sorry. However, in summary, I believe that before seeking further legislative changes, we should focus on changing the culture around childcare so fathers feel comfortable exercising their paternity leave. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Monica Leonard, be followed by Gillian Martin. Ms Lennon, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and apologies to Fulton McGregor for missing the first couple of minutes of his speech, but I thank the PO for prior approval on that. Um, I was really pleased to see this motion come forward when it did, and to add my support to Fulton McGregor's uh, campaign, which he's been very determined on and uh, has helped to keep issues around paternity leave and support for families high on the, the political agenda. Um, I first met Fulton McGregor when we were both elected to the Scottish Parliament in 2016 and I got the impression quite early on that he was very passionate about, about parenting because I remember one um, meeting one evening in, in Parliament where uh, Fulton excused himself, he popped out to FaceTime his young son which I thought was, was very cute. Um, I hope he just wasn't making it up but I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure that he wasn't. <laughs> but um, it, it's easy for me to, to agree with, with Fulton McGregor in this debate. Um, it's been um, Labour policy for some time that the paternity leave should be doubled for dads, and that was a pledge in our manifesto. And Fulton McGregor's already mentioned North Lancashire Council, which is in my region. So I think that's an excellent step forward. And again, there's obviously cross party working there. So I think when we do have things that, that we agree on, um, it is important that we do come together because it benefits all of our constituents. Families come in all shapes and sizes, but it's still the case that in the majority of families, um, women continue to have the primary responsibility for daily childcare, um, although my own husband might disagree with that in, in, in our case. Um, but it's not always through free choice um, of mums and dads. For the one in four men in the UK who are not entitled to paternity leave, it's simply not an option for dads to share the caring responsibilities for a newborn. And it's not good for mums who are left to go on with it themselves, which can be a difficult task after uh, the, the physical toll of, of childbirth. Um, I know in my own experience, my daughter's now 12, but um, I was fortunate my mum had some annual leave that she could take um, when my daughter Isabella was born, and that helped me in the, in the early weeks. Um, but new dads too often are just expected just to, to, to get on with it and, and get back to work. And there can be a lot of, um, well, there can be a roller coaster of emotions uh, for new fathers, but um, you know, very rarely are any adjustments made in the, in the workplace for what is a life-changing event. Um, it's difficult for dads to take unpaid leave, um, especially due to the expenses occurred from having a baby in a neonatal unit, um, from transport costs to expensive hospital food and drink, and worse still for dads who are on low pay or living on benefits. So I'm really proud of the work um, brought forward by my colleague Mark Griffin, who successfully campaigned for the introduction of the Neonatal Expenses Fund to help families cover the costs and lighten this burden after his own baby daughter um, Rosa was born prematurely. And that's another example where Mark worked constructively with the former Cabinet Secretary for Health, uh, Health Shona Robeson. Um, and I'm delighted that baby Rosa made an appearance in the, in the chamber uh, last week and I think that put a smile on, on many faces. Um, we, we still know that, that women are um, more likely to be in, in precarious work uh, and, and low pay and not just have the burden of, of, of childcare but also caring for other members of, of the family too and, and we do need to, to go a long way to, to equalise um, that. I think that 
what, what Fulton McGregor said in terms of Aviva, um, there's some encouraging work there in the private sector too, but I think it is quite you know, worrying that some of the responses from health boards and from other councils haven't been as positive. I think as employers, we would want... We would want all employers to benefit the, the skills uh, that parents can bring into the workplace too, parents and carers, and hopefully um, the, the work that, that, that Fulton will continue to take forward uh, will help to change some of the attitudes and the culture across our society. Thank you. Thank you. I don't like saying this, but please, full names. I know we're all very happy in Pali, but it is full names here. It's Mr McGregor or Fulton McGregor, but not unfortunately just... Fulton. Um, can I now call Gillian Martin to be followed and the last speaker will be Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, President Officer. I, I, I too want to thank Fulton McGregor. Um, I, when I think of Fulton McGregor, I think of him as a, a champion for dad's rights, as he has been ever since I've, I've known him. Um, and I, th I think that we really need strong um, father's voices in here, we're talking about these shared ambition to have more the quality um, of opportunity of, of both parents to spend time with their children, but also to not let that to spending time with their children impact on their chances at work. And I think that Kenny Gibson made very good points around that, and, and that seems to be one of the reasons why so many men feel that they can't take parental leave is because of the impact that might have on their work and attitudes at work. But for, you know, for, for decades, now, women have been actually bearing the brunt of those attitudes when they come back from maternity leave. Um, I am one such example, um, and I've mentioned this in the chamber before when I had my first child, Louis. Um, you know, I, I was being mooted as being good into management, I was in management training programmes, and then once I decided to have a baby, all those sort of things were dropped. And I think that men look at what happens to their f female core workers when they come back from maternity leave, and you, know, you can understand why they think, I don't want a piece of that action. You know, they want the benefits of, of being with their, their newborn children, but actually the fallout in, in, their, in their work can often be quite significant. Um, I, I would like to hear more about the normalisation of the word parental leave rather than putting it into the two categories. And I think the language around this, if we change the language around this, um, maybe the actions will, will follow. But the fact remains, um, I was looking at some of the statistics, HMRC uh, said that just 9,200 fathers this last year took any paternity leave. And if you think about it, there's about three quarters in the quarters of a million um, babies born, um, that, that, that really puts it into, you know, the, the picture is quite stark there. Um, of course, I mean, the, 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 no one's ever saying that the fathers are not wanting to play their part. That's absolutely not what's happening. There are lots of reasons why they feel that they can't take that, that leave that they're entitled to. And of course, as has been mentioned by a few people, there's a lot of fathers that aren't entitled to any paid parental leave as well. Perhaps they're on zero hours contracts. Perhaps, you know, the, the gig economy, they're self-employed, they don't have these rights. But for the ones that, that do, why are they not t taking up those rights? Well, a lot of it's down to the fact that they just can't afford it. They can't afford to take the leave because still they're earning more, they're, they're earning more money than their partner. The gender pay gap's been mentioned, uh, and the gender pay gap is still has an impact on men, and I'd like to see more men standing up and actually railing against the gender pay gap, because it would be good for men and women for there not to be a gender pay gap, and for the financial reason that the, you know it's it's mum that stays at home with the children because dad earns more. If we didn't have a gender pay gap, that just wouldn't be something that that, that would come into the equation. Um, flexible working has also been mentioned as well, and I think that. It, it's great what, what Lanitz, uh, is at South Lanarkshire Council are doing, but I often see that the public sector leads the way in this, but the private sector never really catches up in any meaningful way, and certainly that's something that I've, I've, I've noticed in working in the public and private sector myself. Um, Fulton McGregor has mentioned that I was going to mention um, paternity leave uh, with re regard to parents who have um, premature children premature babies and there was a fantastic submission to this debate from Bliss Scotland and um, talking about um, how often we'll have a situation where there was a, a premature baby born 
but there's other children in the family that need looked after as well. And one parent has to be in the, the hospital the entire time. What happens with the, 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 the other, other children at home as well? And I just want to finish on this note. It was a mother baby who, uh, baby who received neonatal care and said, my husband was still going to work during the day and trying to cover the care of our other child at home. The nurses in the unit used to laugh at him because they thought he was in shift work. He would go at midnight or one o'clock in the morning to visit the baby because that was the only way he could fit it into the this day, uh, into his day. And that's an unacceptable situation, particularly when you see that around the world there's examples of countries that offer extended parental leave and maternity leave to the parents of prematurely born babies. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you. I call Jeremy Balfour, last speaker in the open debate. Mr Balfour, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. And again, can I thank uh, Fulton uh, McGregor for, for bringing this uh, important debate, and I think it is an important debate. Can I particularly welcome his opening line of his motion, where he widens it out uh, to those who have adopted or surrogacy, that we're moving it just beyond birth parents, um, and we are including all families in regard to this. I mean, I think it is disappointing uh, that the Greens and Lib Dems aren't here today to hear this debate, uh, because I think uh, we do need to build a cross-party consensus on this. So soon. Gillian Martin. I just want to thank Jeremy Balfour for being one of the people that responded to the cross-party group call for members to be involved in the cross-party group and share parenting. Um, and I note the fact that it's actually only the Conservatives and SNP that have actually got um, members in that CPG. Would you uh, join me in asking more to join that CPG? Jeremy Balfour. Uh, yes, um, absolutely. And I look forward, uh, hopefully, to being in a cross-party group um, next uh, Tuesday evening. I think it's also important that we have role models. Um, I mean, I think many people thought it was quite cute that Chris Evans uh, appeared 48 hours after um, his twins were born uh, and there was this kind of, uh, what is the name of a baby? But actually, if we do need role models to take proper time off to show that it is okay to do it, and I do think um, celebrities and other people such as that um, I do need to show that way, and I am you know, grateful that my own uh, group leader, party leader, is going to be taking time off um, once uh, the baby safely arrives. Um, I do think there has been a change in attitude. A um, number of people have mentioned um, a certain insurance company, and I think that is good. And certainly I look back on my uh, own uh, childhood uh, compared to how perhaps I try to parent uh, my two daughters, and certainly I think fathers are more involved and do have a more hands-on role. I wonder if I could just develop slightly some of the comments uh, made by Gillian Martin um, around those uh, babies who are born prematurely. Um, my two daughters, Kez and Ellie, um, they've always wanted to be mentioned in the chamber, so I said I would do it at some <laughs> point. Um, they were born uh, premature and ended up for uh, three weeks up in the Simpsons uh, maternity unit here in Edinburgh. Uh, the care that they received, we re received as a family, was outstanding. But I was very fortunate. I had a, um, a boss uh, who was very flexible about the hours I worked so that my wife and I could be in and out um, to look after and to be with them. There are 6,000 babies born here in Scotland on an annual basis who end up in um, neonatal care. Some will stay for a fairly short time, others can stay for a very long time. And thanks to, again, the Bliss uh, briefing, I understand that 65% of fathers will return to work before their child or children leave uh, that unit. And that does put a pressure on families. It does put a pressure on fathers of trying to juggle going to work and also spending time um, with their children. There are models um, across other parts of Europe where fathers who um, have children who end up in care or special care for a short or longer period of time do get longer uh, in regard to time off. And I think that is something that we need to look at um, and see what support we can give. I, I also do welcome some of the changes that are happening. I think we need to have a look at those and see whether things go forward. But ultimately, I think um, my colleague uh, was co correct, Alison Harris was correct, in that this is actually fundamentally a societal issue. It's how society perceives it. 
And until we change that, any legislation or any warm words from politicians will actually only take us so far down the road. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure your daughters are now delighted. Uh, I now call on uh, Jamie Hepburn to close for the government. Uh, Minister, please. Oh, are you Cabinet Secretary? I can't remember. Not yet. No, no, you're not. <laughs> oh, I, I hope I've blighted your chances. Minister, please. <laughs> well, let's face it, President Officer, it wouldn't be the first time you've blighted my chances in, in, in some uh, fashion. Can I... Uh, I begin by uh, joining with others uh, in uh, thanking uh, Fulton McGregor for, for bringing uh, the debate. As Monica uh, Lennon uh, said, it, I'm also uh, very pleased to see that uh, we are debating this uh, issue as well. I think it's very important that, as the uh, National Legislature of Scotland, we keep a, a firm focus on this uh, issue. And uh, Fulton McGregor has allowed us the chance uh, to do uh, that uh, today. I will say the only downside of the debate thus far is to learn that Jeremy Balfour is much more up-to-date with celebrity culture than I am. I was blissfully unaware that Chris Evans was even still on the radio, uh, let alone uh, a, a recent father, so I thank him for uh, enlightening me uh, in that regard. Uh, clearly, uh, employment law is, is reserved. It's not the responsibility of this parliament to legislate for or the Scottish Government to uh, administer. I won't linger on that fact uh, too much because this has been a, a very consensual uh, debate. But what I would observe is that that doesn't mean that we, as a government, should not act. We should uh, lead by example, and that is what we have sought to do, uh, President Officer. We uh, have uh, put in place a policy where, by, uh, that in the terms of our own workforce and those of the public bodies we have responsibility for, uh, new fathers are entitled to four weeks uh, consecutive uh, paternity leave on full pay. I do think others uh, should follow. It is very uh, positive to learn that uh, North Lancashire Council has implemented the policy it has. It is not often that Fulton McGregor and I get the chance to uh, congratulate North Lancashire Council. It is incumbent on us to do so uh, when we have the opportunity and they are to be commended uh, for what they have done. There are others out there uh, too and we need to see more public bodies uh, follow suit. But I would uh, share uh, Jelly Martin's uh, observation. It can't just be down to the public sector. We also need the private sector to be involved in this uh, agenda uh, as well. This is, of course, a part of a wider uh, Fair Work uh, agenda. We have uh, long uh, held the view that we must uh, ensure that we uh, have the benefits of uh, that Fair Work uh, approach, uh, have inclusive workplace practices for employees generally, but working uh, parents in particular in the context of uh, this uh, debate. Um, we have, uh, I believe, here in Scotland been ahead of the uh, a curve on the Fair Work agenda for uh, some time. Uh, support for parents has to be a uh, part of the context of uh, that uh, agenda. Uh, in that regard, uh, of course, I have referred to the fact that the Scottish Government has put in place its own policy for its own uh, workforce. We have also put in place, uh, for example, the Carers Positive uh, scheme to uh, seek uh, employers to come forward to uh, uh, sign up to that initiative so that they have in place a, a policy to support uh, carers with their caring responsibility, many of whom will, of course, be uh, parents. We have also uh, talked about the benefits of flexible working. This uh, government is fully signed up to uh, the concept of flexible working. We have put that in place and so far as possible for our own uh, workforce. And we work and indeed are part of the family-friendly uh, working a Scotland a partnership to help advance the flexible working uh, agenda. Uh, that's why since 2014 we have been able to provide nearly £700,000 worth uh, of uh, funding for uh, that uh, organisation to take forward its uh, work. Uh, Kenny Gibson was quite correct to say the uh, benefits of that agenda I think are probably self-evident for uh, employees, but employers also greatly uh, benefit by that approach as well in terms of reduced absenteeism, uh, uh, increased uh, staff retention and increased levels of productivity. And as part of that flexible working arrangement, they should be considering how they can better support uh, fathers with, with um, uh, their share of, um, the, uh, of parental responsibility. Uh, we are uh, committed to working with uh, employers to encourage and spread a progressive uh, practice. We do know that there is uh, an issue with regard to the uptake of uh, parental leave for uh, fathers. Alison Harris referred to the UK government's uh, shared uh, parental leave uh, regulations, uh, which applied from the 5th of April 2015, allowing 
uh, families to, to share parental leave uh, between them uh, better than was the case before. Uh, I do not think they go far enough, but they are in place. We believe that they should be utilised better. They are not being utilised well enough at this uh, moment in time. There are uh, some issues involved in terms of perceived complexity of the system and uh, the uh, concern that the perception that exists out there that there will be a negative impact on a father's career and also uh, a perception that mothers will have to lose out in terms of their entitlement to uh, maternity uh, leave. Uh, these are all um, part of wider cultural uh, issues. Um, there are perceived cultural norms that are changing. They're changing probably too slowly, but Fulton McGregor was quite correct to, to set out. Uh, it's far better than our grandparents and our parents' generation. I my grandfather would even change the nappy, uh, let alone uh, be that uh, involved in the day-to-day -day care of his uh, children. We are uh, much uh, improved, but there's still a, a long way uh, to go. And in that context, uh, Jelly Martin was correct. Perhaps we should start talking about paternity uh, leave, uh, as big to pardon, paternal uh, leave rather than maternity or paternity to leave, leave to, to imbue the sense that this is a shared responsibility. I would encourage all uh, employers in that regard to work in partnership with their workforce, encourage uh, employers to work in partnership with the workforce at all times, of course, but in this particular agenda uh, to ensure that as a minimum they are making uh, their workforce aware of uh, the UK government regulations that have been put in place, but also to, to consider going further as well, voluntarily offering enhanced paternity leave and to make family-friendly working practices more mainstream in our economy, thus helping uh, to eliminate some of the barriers that uh, affect the, the uptake of uh, paternal uh, leave. The uh, benefits of uh, the approach that we debate today are, uh, I think, it's self-evident for children and for fathers in terms of building the relationship. There's also been the point made around um, those children born prematurely. Uh, Jenny Martin made that point, Monica Lennon did, Jeremy Balfour very powerfully did in terms of talking about his own uh, personal experience. There is also here a very important part of the agenda in terms of, uh, of gender equality. Fulton McGregor uh, quite correctly made the point that other countries that are more progressive in their practice uh, have much uh, greater gender equality with a lower gender pay gap, an area that we are focusing on and have established the gender pay gap working group and this will be part of the agenda we consider. So let me close, President Officer, by emphasising once again the, the Government's commitment to supporting working parents. Next week it marks National Work Life Week, which is an opportunity for both employers and employees to focus on wellbeing at work and work-life balance. I very much look forward to seeing employers in Scotland showcasing their flexible working policies and practices and in particular in the context of today's debates how parents can be better supported in their uh, work life balance. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes the debate. Can I thank everyone for their contributions and suspend this meeting of Parliament until two thirty.